William Peters is a licensed psychotherapist and is the founder of the Shared Crossing Project. He's recognized by many as the world's leading authority on the shared death experience. His book is titled At Heaven's Door, What Shared Journeys to the Afterlife Teach Us About Dying Well and Living Better. Please see the description for timestamps, relevant links, and a reading list. So William, to start us off, can you please give your definition of a shared death experience? Yeah, so a shared death experience occurs when somebody dies mm -hmm. and a caregiver, loved one, sometimes even a bystander, uh, reports that they feel like they somehow shared in the transition with this dying person into the initial stages of the afterlife. And these can happen at bedside. Uh, they can also happen remotely. And it's interesting that when uh, the early research on this, I say the early research in the kind of the modern era, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Raymond Moody wrote yeah. a, a book called Glimpses of Eternity. In all of the cases that he had, uh, which, you know, as he said, were letters written to him uh, through, you know, the last 30 years prior to that book, primarily, uh, were examples of people at bedside. Mm. Well, we took uh, that definition that, that Raymond had offered, and we did a wider search, and I started lecturing uh, about the SDE because um, I had had these experiences myself. But the point being is what we have found in our research is that about 64% are actually remote. Wow. That means they are not at bedside, mm. that they are happening right around the time of death uh, of a loved one. And the experiencer will say something like, I was just doing my life. And all of a sudden, this person came into my mind, may or may not have known that that person was in a dying process, could have been a sudden death, could have been a slower uh, death, perhaps with a a cancer or some type of organ failure, mm -hmm. but whatever the situation, they would report uh, often a very similar experience uh, in terms of the features you see at the bedside SDE. Wow. So that's the general definition. It's the sense that somebody typically very close, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment, but somebody basically says, I shared somehow Mm -hmm. in some meaningful way in the transition of a dying person. Now, I'll give you kind of what we see as the constituent parts, if you will, of the SDE uh, in terms of what makes it, what, what are the kind of the foundational pieces? Well, one yeah. is um, just by way of large definition, the experience is almost identical to the near-death experience. The features we see are almost identical. So when yeah. you talk about the dominant features, you're talking about um, seeing the light, deceased relatives, heavenly realms, and of course, these these, these feelings of euphoria, mm -hmm. of joy, of love, the kind of the highest virtues available in the human existence. So gratitude, um, compassion, and then this sense of higher consciousness, the sense of knowing that everything is okay just the way it is. Everything's connected. There's this higher level of consciousness. And this is particularly um, poignant for the SDE experiencer because we hear this quite a bit. A mother whose son is dying and she is with him, she's with him in the afterlife. I'm thinking we have a lot of mothers who lose um you know, sons in their late in their late teens, early twenties. That's a high risk time for males. And so, um, I'm thinking of a case that's really emblematic of this. A woman says, "My son was in an accident, um, a car accident. I was with him in the afterlife. He looked at me, and he said, "Mom, I love you, but if I come back, I will never be the same.'" I, wow. I I want to I want to leave. And in a certain way, he's asking for permission. Mm. But what's so phenomenal about this is that the mother, and this is like almost every mother that we've had in this situation, and similarly with spouses, mm. saying from that point, from that state of existence in this 
SDE space, this, this initial afterlife space, with this sense of higher knowing and higher consciousness, these mothers or spouses respond with, I understand. It's your time to go. Yeah. I love you. Be well. And they they report that in that space, they, the, the wisdom comes to them to let their children go or to let their spouses go. So they have a very, uh, what I would say, enlightened uh, goodbye with yeah. a fuller understanding of a purpose of a human life. And that, of course, that sense what comes with this, and we'll talk about this later, hopefully, is included in this experience is the is the knowing that we as beings go on that yeah. we are you know once you're alive in the afterlife sounds like a strange sentence but that's what it is <laughs> you're alive in the afterlife and you're there with your loved one and you see them in existence outside of the human body you realize yeah uh, the show does not stop at human death yeah. and so uh, i share that because um this one of the pieces that comes with this experience. So I, the relationship is very important. The features uh, are, are are just like the NDE. And I've mentioned some of those features and I'll mention more in, in our in our time together today. Um, and then the other pieces about it, when you talk about this, uh, this sense of higher consciousness, love, uh, and a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, the sense of when they go into this space, the sense of, ah, oh, this is my true home. This is where I came from. This feels so much more real and so much more um, meaningful in a certain way. And it's a yeah. strong term. Um, but when you have the knowing in that space, it, it places in context just how difficult a human life is to to make sense of why are we here what are we doing it's a realm with a good deal of suffering um and, but when you're in that afterlife space uh, though this human existence comes into to view in a different way and um there's some loss when you come back here both nde experiencers and shared death experiencers report uh, some disappointment that they yeah. have to return in some cases some anger um, so that those are the pieces uh, that that's kind of initial definition of the SDE, and I can say a lot more when yeah. when uh, yeah I bet <laughs> no that's a it's a brilliant kind of yeah like a intro breakdown um, it's it's really valuable um, I wanted to check as well I wanted to ask you I I believe this to be the case but is it it's not all shared death experiences that go to another realm i don't think is it that there are there also some where it would be for example like um the person that's that's transitioning or dying comes to somebody like in the form of an apparition or it doesn't have to be visual or anything like that but in some context they 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 visit that person and then kind of in essence that's it and it's just like yeah. this fleeting goodbye moment thing is that yeah Great question, Ben. So I'm going to give you um, the four, what we call, or what you know, my team and I have have come up with is the four modes of participation okay. for an SDE experience, and, and mm -hmm. there are four of them. And we'll start with the most basic, the one that you actually just alluded to, and we call this sensing at a distance. Right. So about, and these are not mutually exclusive, by the way. Um, but this one is a remote SDE. It happens in about 25%, 20 to 25% of our cases will be something like this. Somebody's dying and the loved one is typically a loved one or caregiver who's close to the, to the person dying reports that at or around the time of the death, they had this sense of knowing mm -hmm. that this, that this person something was happening for this person. It may be that they saw the person just kind of come into their mind space. Yeah. Um, and when they saw them and that person said something like, thank you. I love you. Goodbye. We actually see this uh, reported in our research. I was just doing my life and cooking a meal. And all of a sudden I saw my father and I just, he was in my mind's eye and I felt him. I felt love come across my body. There's a tingle. And then I, I just kind of saw him in a moment. He dropped in. He said, thank you. I'm well, goodbye. 
and it just yeah. happens in a in a in a flash. And that's also what I called in the early days a flyby. Um, okay. and, and and hospice workers, the, some hospice workers I know um, will have that language here in the United States. So I'll say, "Oh, it's a flyby." Right. And, and they often, in fact, one of the reasons I came up with that is because um, a hospice worker, uh, two hospice workers, actually, who were partners, shared this with us in our research. And they were talking about um, caring for somebody. And he came uh, to one of the partners very briefly, and they call it a flyby. So that's the that's a basic type of sensing at a distance. Some people will actually have a strong sympathetic response. And we call this a sympathetic SDE. Okay. It is a sensing at a distance, but it is a strong sensing. So the most, um, I shouldn't say the most common because we it's one of the more prevalent is a loved one. And oftentimes it's a relative, a parent will suddenly, you know, wake up in a certain way and feel nauseous and might even start throwing up. Uh, and then they'll learn that a relative uh, has died of a drug overdose. And and so they and they make sense of it by saying, oh, my loved one was trying to reach out to me in some way. And I was somehow brought into their last earthly experience. And that's what I experienced. Yeah. And at first, you know, when we when we first were capturing these experiences, we thought, wow, that's really far fetched. Yeah. Um, but then we now have at least, you know, a half dozen to a dozen of these cases, specifically with drug overdoses. And and specifically with the nausea and the vomiting. Is yeah, it? specifically. Yeah. Really we also have yeah. a, a, a few cases where um, this a cardiac situation where uh, I'll give a case right now. And this is a woman who was uh, in her car mm -hmm. and she was about to drive up to see her spiritual teacher. And her spiritual teacher, she just she describes all of a sudden feeling a pressure on her chest and a great deal of pain. And she goes, oh, my God, something's happening to me. And she goes, oh, am I having a heart attack? I mean, she just like she's short of breath. And then she kind of falls over the wheel. And then uh, she says she comes to a couple moments later. She doesn't know how much time passed. She goes, wow, that was bizarre. She gets in, you know, kind of pulls herself together. And she starts driving up to see this teacher who's, you know, she's in, in Oregon in the United States. And she's in her way, you know, I think up to Washington, which is a few hours drive. Mm -hmm. And literally within a few minutes of taking off, she reports she gets a call. Um, and she learns that her teacher has died of a heart attack in that exact moment that she had her experience uh -huh. healing over yeah. the car. So we have a number of experiences like that. And these are what we call remote, uh, sensing at a distance, sympathetic, sympathetic SDEs. Mm. So that's just the first type of mode of participation. Just the first type. Now, I should also say the most common type of remote is somebody gets awoken in the middle of the night and says, oh, and they're thinking of so-and-so like, oh, I wonder what happened. Um, yeah. I, and it's like, oh my gosh, I just felt so and so, and they may not know exactly what's going on, but then something happened, and it can be a whole lot of phenomena. A lot, I mean, like it can be they're worried, it can be they're seeing visions of that person, it can be that uh, they're seeing memories of their time together, it can be strong emotions of love and gratitude for that person, and. Can it also, I, sorry, not to interrupt you, but just a yeah. quick little interruption. Can it also be uh, like like almost nothing? Like they just wake up unnaturally at a random, you know, 3.33 in the yeah. morning and they don't necessarily think about that person, but they're just like, they're awake. And then they go back to sleep, whatever. They The next day they find out, yeah, somebody died at that time. And they're like, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would be, um, re, you know, that would be uh, a remote SDE sensing Without the distance the... but i have to say that one we we'd have to we'd have to do more research on that we'd have to really interview them to make sure that yeah. this qualify for sde we would need a phenomenological threshold maybe more of an end of life experience yeah i, guess. I yeah. mean that would be what you know peter fenwick would call a deathbed coincidence mm -hmm. um 
um, we're looking more for a strong synchronicity. Um, okay. And not that Peter doesn't go in, a lot of his deathbed coincidences are uh, SDEs, and, and he's yeah. got a lot more data than that. I mean, a lot more phenomena. So we would we would agree with Peter and I and, and my team on this. But just to be clear, that person has to say to us, it was at this time, and now that I think about it, I know they were reaching out to us, or mm -hmm. I'm now pretty clear they're reaching out to us. So it has to, it can't be just conjecture for us. And SDE mm -hmm. has a communication base in it that yeah. that is affirmative. Okay. Um, so the second mode of participation is our most common. It's we see it in about 85% of our cases. I said these are not mutually exclusive. Um, but this is sensing, witnessing, observing what we would call death-related phenomena. Really what it is is kind of this end-of-life phenomena associated with NDEs and SDEs. So that's... Um, out-of-body experiences, uh, that's seeing heavenly realms, that's mm -hmm. past life reviews, that's seeing deceased relatives or elevated beings, that's a tunnel, that's the light, seeing a prof prof uh, profound light that in the NDE is usually a certain type of light out in the distance that the experiencers are moving towards, in the SDE, it, we have that, but we also have cylinders of light. We have pathways of light. And mm. that often the experiencer reports that the dying is, or the transitioning, is uh, ascending up that light. We also see ascension as a feature. Uh, the journey motif, and I, I should have said this in the very beginning in terms of the primary or one of the primary characteristics uh, when you define the SDE, is journey motif. You see the experiencer reports that the dying uh, is on a journey. We see movement, often ascension. Um, and even in the remotely sensing at a distance, there is journey involved because often the experiencer will say, uh, my loved one dropped in for a moment and then took off. And it's yeah. that sense of movement in and out, um, yeah. but they're moving. Uh, so, so we that's not an essential requirement for the SDE, but it's common. So this this uh, this second type of SDE, this mode of participation, second mode of participation is observing and sensing this profound end of life phenomena, or transition based phenomena. The third mode of participation is what we call accompanying, and this happens in about. 10% of our cases, 8 to 10%. Okay. This is where the shared death experiencer reports that they are somehow accompanying the dying on their journey. They are with them. They are moving with them along in this journey. And yeah. there is communication between them typically. Uh, so they participate in this journey. And it's beautiful. These experiences always include the... Uh, witnessing and observing uh, this phenomena, death-related phenomena, which is in the mode of participation too. So it's inclusive of mode of participation too. And then there is our mode of participation four, which is assisting or guiding the dying. And these are situations, this is about 5% of our cases, so about one in 20. And when these cases come up, they're spectacular because the SDE experiencer reports that they were invited in somehow to this experience. Somehow they're, yeah. they're there with the dying and the dying needs their assistance. It may be as simple as, you know, I'm quoting a case, dad, you've died. And the dad is confused because here, let me help you. And the experiencer will kind of carry the transitioning loved one further, usually ascension, usually moving towards the light. Oftentimes there are deceased relatives there to greet them. And it's the sense of dad, look who's here. Dad, turn around. Or, you know, all sorts of guiding where uh, a best friend will show up um, to somebody. I'm thinking of another case, someone's died of cancer. And in this case, 
Um, this woman shows up for her best friend. By the way, this is a remote SDE. And by the way, most, if not all of these assisting and accompanying mm -hmm. SDEs tend to be remote. They're not exclusively right. remote, but for some reason, they we see a higher yeah. predominance there. Uh, and so they show up in this afterlife space and orient the transitioning to this space. And you may ask, as I always ask, how did you know what to do when you, when you got called in? Mm. And they'll say, I had no idea why I was there at first. Yeah, yeah. Then the information for how to assist my loved one or how to guide my loved one arose within me. Yeah. So yeah. The, these are profound, you know, cases. And if you think of it, we've done, you know, 300 plus interviews um and you know we have that's interesting i said five percent are guiding it's higher than that now we'd have to you know the last time we did a big um data crunch was when we published in the american journal of hospice and palliative medicine it's a you know high-minded uh you know rigorous journal with scholarly standards that we had to really meet both qualitatively and quantitatively and at that mm -hmm. time um, I think we had, I want to say five or 6% assisting, but now we have, I think our number would be higher. Um, so that gives you an idea of the, the four modes of participation, uh, yeah. which, you know, uh, really give you, you an idea for what we see, uh, mm -hmm. in various types of experience that the SDE experiencers can have. And that's why we call it the mode of participation. How do they participate experientially yeah. in the SDE? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I love that. I love that there's, yeah, these, as you, as you say, it's kind of this sliding scale, you know, it can either be a very fleeting moment or it can be, yeah, you're actually involved somehow on some level and, and you're actually helping. Yeah. I mean, you, you probably know Lloyd Auerbach, right? I know Brief. the name, but I don't know him personally. Okay. And, and I don't um, know his work if he's a, uh, yeah. He's a parapsychologist and he's written, you know, a lot about the, you know, these areas like apparitions mm -hmm. and various psi phenomena and various things like that. Anyway, I've spoken to him a few times, but he, he told me a story about a chair death experience that he had that kind of, um, it was basically a, a smell. He he had a smell of the, the. I think it was like a kind of mixture of this cologne and cigarette smoke that that his close friend had smoked. Um, and this smell just joined him in his car at at the time of death that he found out later, the time of death. And then he spoke to you know other mutual friends, and they also had the same kind of experience at the same kind of time. I can't remember if it was the exact same time or if it was you know like a a couple of minutes or whatever spread but anyway i just uh it, it's really fascinating and it just made me think of that um yeah so i have I a can, bunch of questions for you as I, well I sorry can, go on so that experience is what we would call the olfactory experience that sense of smell it yeah. would be a depending on more information that would qualify as sensing at a distance it would be one yeah. of the sense doors that gets activated and yeah, like your, you know, Lloyd has said here, this is common. Um, yeah. I mean, how common? Common enough that we identify it as a code when we're yeah. going one of our, you know, we have about 70 codes and, and it's an olfactory experience. And it typically is perfume. If it was a smoker, mm -hmm. smoke. Sometimes it's just, you know, their, their, you know, their body aroma. Um, but it's undeniably them. And, yeah. and so, yes, that would be That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. The sense of knowing like, yeah, like you say, the un undeniably them. Yeah. I got a few other questions just about the stuff you were saying, um, or not necessarily just about the stuff you were saying, but I just wrote down a few notes. Um, so one thing was um, in terms of, you know, when you're traveling with if somebody's traveling with them or participating in the ND, the SD, um, have you ever had any cases where multiple people um, remotely traveled with the same person so for example you know say somebody's parent is passing away and they have two or three children scattered across a country or the world um have there ever been a case where yeah more than one of those children have has traveled with or, or you know experienced this with the parent have you ever had anything like that 
Yeah, we have not had, um, that's what we call a multi-person SDE. So let me go back and give you kind of a lexicon, then we'll go right to that question. So um, the most general typology we have, in addition to the modes of participation, but uh, is this foundational typology. Uh, mm -hmm. Bedside, uh, and, which is about, about a little over one third of the cases, and, and remote, which would be, like I said, about two thirds. Um, now we call them bedside, but sometimes it's not bedside in the sense that, you know, if someone dies in an accident, you're right with them when they die. Or we have a few cases where someone's drowning and they're seeing them drown at a distance. That would be, you know, depending on how close you are, it can be remote or bedside. So they, they can they can be a little fuzzy, but you get the point. Yeah. And yeah. then then we have sub subtypes. And the first subtype has to do with time. Um, in other words, about 77% happen at the exact time of death. But we have about 9% that happen early, a few moments, minutes, and sometimes hours earlier. Hours and, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes we have about 13% will be delayed we call that a delayed sde and that same thing minutes hours and very few cases it can be you know up to a day or so and and you might say wow a day or so how could that be and why wouldn't you put that in the category of a post-death vision or visitation well the sde is a very different um mm. qualitative phenomena than a vision or visitation and i could go yeah. into that but we have you know a whole you know, we have a, a way to a differentiating process um, mm -hmm. to to discern which is which. Yeah. So um, but but that that so that's how you would break. That's a subcategory that time, the, the quality of time. So sometimes someone will call up us or submit a case to us uh, at which we are constantly submitting. We're receiving cases on our website and they'll say, I don't think this is an SDE because it happened a few hours after my loved one died. Well, they start sharing with us. We go, well, this is absolutely an SDE. It's got all the features that we look for. And it's not a visitation. It's not a post. It's not an ADC, an after-death communication. Um, it is it, technically, but it fits better into the SDE category because of the, the features we see. Um, yeah. So, okay. And then we also have a gradual SDE that also is part of this first sub uh, type. And the gradual means it starts, but it continues over, you know, minutes, hours. And in some cases we have days yeah, and it's wow. like, it's like, well, why, how can you call this an SDE if it happens over days? Well, it's because they have the same phenomena. They enter into the afterlife. They see the loved one. They're participating in the journey. They're having the euphoric feelings. Um, mm. They're moving through space with them and it's gradual. And that means, it can come and go or it can be consistent. And we have people say, um, especially our more mindful people, um, and later hopefully we'll talk about some of the characteristics of our SDE experiencers, because there is not so much a type, but there's a, type, a, a person that has certain types of practices that seem to enable these. But okay. uh, with some of these, like I say, more spiritually open-minded, receptive people, they almost can cultivate the SDE over time and will say that, oh, I, could, I, I, I was, I could go back in and out of that space. Doesn't mean they could actually see the dying. Sometimes they can, but they could get back into that, that space of the euphoria and the, the loving yeah. feelings and that sense of being out of their body, all of that. So that is all part of the gradual SDE the first subtype. The second subtype goes directly to what you were asking me about. Um, and that is the multi-person SDE. So mm -hmm. that means can more than one person have the SDE be an experiencer when someone's dying? Absolutely. And um, I just have the new research on that actually. And it's actually, it's about 12, 11 or 12 percent um, will have multi-person. So when someone's dying about you know, one in 10 people, a little over that, there'll be more than one person who have the SDE. And sometimes yeah. they're at bedside surrounded, surrounding the loved one when they're dying. And sometimes 
someone's a bedside and someone's remote and mm-hmm. some and but most of the time it's everyone's remote that's just mm-hmm. what we see um uh so but that also happens to be because most of our cases are remote so you can see yeah. where that just adds up statistically but it's really profound and they sometimes have the same experience and more often than not they have some similar experience but they have distinctly different experience so they may mm-hmm. say uh, I'm thinking of a case right now where one person said um, the light was incredible. And the person said, oh, yeah, but did you see grandma? He said, oh, I didn't see grandma. So it's like, really, you saw grandma? He goes, yeah, grandma was there to meet mom. He goes, oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. And then a third person might say something like, I felt the most incredible feelings around the time my mom died. I, 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 and I felt her tell me she was okay. So you have all these different phenomena that yeah. are possible. And these, this begs the question here, Ben, well, does this have to do with the experiencer's capability to have different, um, you know, psychic experiences, mm-hmm. if you will, or, yeah. you know, or, is this a message? Is this something that's being sent individually, either by the dying or the dying's, you know, spirit guides or higher beings, you know, source? Um, this all lies in the in the realm of mystery. But what yeah. we cannot um, at any what we cannot do any longer as researchers and as people that are astute and looking at these phenomena is to doubt what these experiencers are saying i think now we now know um that these happen with much greater frequency than Mm -hmm. uh we had initially anticipated um you know i can say that the shared crossing research initiative which i founded and continue to direct um in the early days we had no idea how many experiences there were out there and when i started giving talks they came out of the woodwork. I mean, mm-hmm. I, anytime I gave a talk, whether it was the International Association of Near Death Studies or in an afterlife conference or a mental health conferences, because I'm a psychotherapist uh, and working, specializing in end of life and grief and bereavement. When I would give a talk at a conference um, or just a, a talk to a community, uh, an association for mental health practitioners, Typically, the mental health practitioners are a little more conservative than they are at the afterlife conference and and uh, and IANS. Uh, yeah. But they would come up to me afterwards and say, um, "I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. Can I have your card?" And then, you know, inevitably, you know, a, a dozen plus of these people would re, would call me or contact me and yeah. share SDEs, and either their own or with their clients and. So we know these happen in in greater frequency, and you know, since my my book came out on this, um, you know, for just a, a year and a half ago now, we're, we we receive a lot of cases, and what's interesting, we receive a lot of cases that um, are more in what we call the shared crossing category. So people will have um, a visitation from a loved one that's post death that may not be an SDE. But it is part of the a shared crossing phenomenon. And I should just kind of say what a shared crossing is. And this is a larger basket, if you will, or category to hold spiritual end of life phenomena that begins pre-death with pre-death premonitions, pre-death dreams and visions, uh, an experience called terminal lucidity, where the dying seems to wake up right around the time of death and seems to be exhibit behavior that's physiologically unexplainable from the medical perspective because they may have been with dementia and now they're clear and coherent and talking to people around the room. They may Mm -hmm. exhibit physical capabilities like they've been bedridden and now they're getting up and walking, typically looking for their suitcase or trying to catch a train somewhere and i use that quite specifically why because that's the journey motif they're Mm -hmm. beginning a journey and they often are looking for a a mode of transportation Mm -hmm. uh and this is when you get there that's the edge of terminal lucidity 
leaning into the SDE. Uh, yeah. and, and this is, you know, you can parse the boundaries and definitions, but really that's for academics, which we are and do. But for the purpose of like meaning making, hey, th this is all part of the continuum or spectrum of shared crossing experiences. And then we have the SDE right around the moment of death. And then after death, the other shared crossing experiences are post-death. What we call one is direct post-death communication, which happens when uh, the experiencer, a surviving loved one, reports, these are the words we hear, it was like the dying was in my head. The deceased, my loved one, was in my head responding to questions I didn't even know I was asking. Wow. And so that's direct post-death communication. It happens usually the first few weeks after somebody dies. Uh, and specifics about that one, because it is fascinating, is sometimes the, the dying or the now deceased uh, will tell the surviving loved ones, you know, what to do at the funeral, <laughs> you know, mm. who who to give the eulogies, where to seat Aunt Betty, you know, uh, what to wear, uh, that type of yeah. thing. It's that specific. Or where to find this in the house. You can look in my dresser. So it's direct communication specifically yeah. related to the life uh, or the direct message pertinent uh, to the, their relationship or something happening uh, around the death of this person. And then you have a larger basket of post-death visions, visitations, and dreams. And those are where the deceased appear to surviving loved ones, typically. Uh, there is no journey motif in this. So some of your listeners are going to be saying, how do you distinguish this? Well, we have a very clear way of defining these terms and distinguishing them. And for a visitation, there is no journey motif. Uh, mm -hmm. They appear typically at the foot of the bed or elevated uh, in the ceiling of the room, and they look younger, and they appear and they say, essentially, you see them alive and well. I love you. Thank you for caring for me. And they may have some other message, like take care of your brother, or, you know, I'm, you know, please, you know, uh, attend to this matter. Mm -hmm. So, but typically they're recognizable, they're younger and what have you. And we have synchronicities throughout. So pre-death, at time of death, and after death, synchronicity. So animals behave in ways that mm. get people's attention to say, that bird has been sitting on that branch or knocking on this window uh, ever since so-and-so has died, and I don't get this. Um, so, you know, and by the way, it's wintertime and we don't have cardinals in wintertime. So, so there's this type of, you know, phenomena that gets our attention and we call these synchronicities that rise above the threshold of normal behavior. And the, the experiencer will report quite naturally, um, you know, I have lived in this location forever and this behavior is not like anything I've ever seen. And I think it's my departed husband or father or what have you. So there's the whole continuum, if you will, of mm -hmm. shared crossing experiences. So yeah. to go directly back to your question, Ben, when you have this type of SDE in that second category, uh, subtype of multi-person, you asked, do people actually a share in the assisted, like, would you ever have two people in the afterlife together, uh, essentially mm -hmm. going along with the dying through that in the afterlife, progressing on their journey? Um, I don't have many cases. I know I have a few cases like that, but not many. Yeah. And, um, and I do have one case where the daughter was there and the mother was there, and the father had just died. Um, mm. But what's curious about that case is that neither one of them saw each other there. Mm, that is interesting. So there are yeah. so many nuances in what we see. <laughs> yeah. So many nuances. There was, uh, they were both uh, going along on the journey, but they didn't see each other. Yeah. But they did report seeing other deceased relatives commonly. Like they saw the same relatives or at least some overlap. So, you know, 
Um, and by the way, these are very small in numbers. This is like one or two percent of what we see. So certainly yeah. not in the norm. But but I love your question because I can say to you, you know, unequivocally, um, as one who researches these and is you know researched deeply a few hundred and heard you know many thousands at this point, um, it certainly is possible. Like yeah. we know, yeah. if I hear this, I would someone to ask me as you're asking me. Is that, you know, could it be true? Yeah, absolutely. Don't doubt it. Yeah. Because what yeah. we've learned is in the early days, I was much more early days of the research. I was like, no, I you know can't say that. for You know, no, um, we don't see that. I'm sorry, that's not an SDE. Well, um, now with, like I said, the, the amount of cases I've seen, I could say something like, well, I haven't seen that specific phenomena. But. Uh, knowing the SDE as well as we do now, that's mm. a possible feature. I would say yeah. if it feels like it happened, don't doubt yourself. And if you feel like you want to call it an SDE, if it makes sense to you with your study, I would certainly not um, dissuade you from, from identifying with it in that way. Because for so many people I work with in grief and bereavement, these experiences are so far out and uh, and so many mental health practitioners and medical practitioners um, can look at these askance, if not disparagingly. And part of our work, you know, that's the mission of the Shared Crossing Project is to raise awareness about these experiences and and their healing benefits. And one of the healing mm -hmm. benefits for, the, for a person who's had an SDE is to be able to know that this experience is real, it's validated in the research, and not to doubt themselves. So they can affirm themselves as having had this experience. Yeah, uh, something I was going to come back to, actually. But while we're there, I will just ask you, we don't need to spend too long on it. But um, do you see the same kinds of changes in, in terms of yeah healing, but also just changes in general with personality and lifestyle that you see or that we see in, uh, in people that have had an ND, a near-death experience? Great question. And the short answer to that is yes, very similar yeah. transformational changes yeah. or positive beneficial impacts from the experience so let's let's go to the research and look at the primary ones on that because this is you know i got into this research as a psychotherapist as i said working in in grief and bereavement end of life experiences mm -hmm. but you know every time i work with somebody preparing for death i will often work with them after the death and these experiences deliver uh, a few you know, kind of now validated positive impacts. The first being a, a a cessation of anxiety and fear about death. That's the most yeah. common one. Death ceases to be something that is feared. In fact, in most cases, death becomes something that they're very curious about now. Yeah, And you'll yeah. often find an experiencer leaning more into death, wanting to learn more about it, wanting to help others around death and dying. So they take their experience and they feel more comfortable with it now. You know, we live in modern, us moderns uh, are culturally, we're trained to be phobic around death. You know, oh, someone's mm. dying, you know, stay mm. away, you know, don't interfere. And so we push mm. the dying to the margins of society. Mm. And that's just, that's a new modern phenomenon because, you know, in, in, in pre-modern societies, you know, what we know is that, death was a central part of familiar and community life. It was accepted as a natural event. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can see this, you know, in, in, in older, you know, homes, certainly in the United States, uh, we have what we call, you know, antebellum homes or, oh, actually this term Victorian homes as well, which comes from, you know, Great Britain, Queen Victoria in that era, which was a long era uh, for architecture. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but those homes typically have a large anti-room. It's the first room you walk into in these old homes. The hallways aren't, you know, narrow or there's a hallway. Uh, and, yeah. and it's usually, you know, has a place where you can put your coats and, you know, sit down. Uh, and it's big. But you may be wondering, why is this anti-room? If you look at any of these classical homes, they have a big space right after the front door. Well, that's where the bodies of the dying in coffins were typically laid. And the community was invited in to pay respects, pay their final mm -hmm. respects. So this is a long-winded way of saying 
that us moderns push death away. Um, yeah. And so the SDE, as with the NDE, really brings death and dying more into this state of not to be feared and really more to be uh, wondered about in a positive way. Like, mm. wow, that this is just amazing. It's not, death is not as advertised <laughs> in our culture. And so they, the cessation of death is the, is the first and most, perhaps most profound um, after effect. The second yeah. one we see is this belief in an afterlife. And a sense of knowing that their loved one has survived human death and and is alive and well in a benevolent place, you know, uh, can be called heaven, although that's kind of can be loaded re in religious language. Um, but it's a benevolent place. You, if you want to use a more Eastern way of looking at it, maybe a Deva realm of some sort, um, however mm -hmm. you want to call it, a, a benevolent astral plane. Uh, but whatever language you want to use or whatever spiritual tradition you come from, it's benevolent. It's a good place. And that mm -hmm. provides a great deal of solace, healing for the surviving loved ones. Uh, the other the other phenomena we see is this kind of understanding, a renewed purpose and understanding for a human life. Uh, they seem to wake up to the sense that, oh, this life has meaning. Um, yeah. and, and I better go about uh, living it. And some people will make very significant changes in their life, change relationships, change professions, uh, get about uh, something that they've been putting off for a long time, because now they know life is short and it has me purpose and meaning. And they, they need to go about doing that. Um, and so, and then others talk about, it's kind of a heightened sense of spiritual or psychic or intuitive abilities. These mm -hmm. are all similar, by the way, to the NDE. Uh, yeah. So, and then I think the piece that's unique to the SDE is that their grief and bereavement processes are radically different. Uh, yeah. They don't, they, they, they experience the loss. It's, it's, it's a loss. They miss the person, but they also know that they'll, that, that person is alive and well, they know that they'll see them again. And they have a sense of greater understanding of the or order of the universe. So they understand that death is a natural part of life. And knowing that it it's no longer fits into this medicalized uh, perception of death, which is death is wrong. Death is a failure. Uh, this is yeah. a highly medicalized, you know, way of looking at death, which is quite frankly, sad and pathetic because mm -hmm. how can you be a, a professional working with human bodies and not realize that every human being you ever going to work with is going to die. And mm -hmm. so uh, the SDE really radically changes that and includes death as a natural part of life. And in fact, death becomes a non-existent term for SDEers because in a certain sense, there's only end to a human experience. There is no yeah. end to life. Yeah. Death is a Trans misnomer. Transition. It's just transition. Very yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I think I... Yeah, I think I addressed that question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think that was good. Um, I wanted to ask you, you kind of uh, mentioned it earlier. We didn't get to the numbers or anything, but you, you mentioned about how you know common they are and how, how much more common than we previously thought. Obviously, it's something that's really hard to to actually you know get a handle on same with ndes even though that's been studied maybe for longer and in more depth by more people um but yeah it's imagine if every hospital and every doctor you know gave out a survey after uh to, to the patients and to family members did you have any experiences that would be that would be incredible but in terms of the numbers you're working with now you know you're referencing percentages and things like that how many cases have you got like what what are these percentages of what's the what's the number so uh, you know so we have we've deeply interviewed to date somewhere between 275 and 325 i didn't look at the numbers okay. we have another 120 um that were on our list to interview um yeah I say that, but we're looking for particular types to interview. Like we have to triage, them, yeah. you know, uh, and, and and we're looking for it's like, so for example, um, a particular case we're really interested in and looking at right now 
are this this conductor feature, which I haven't talked about yet, yeah. but I will now. And that's yeah, sure. this sense that the experiencer reports mm -hmm. that they saw an elevated bean come down. Either they either see the bean or they sense it, that this elevated bean is guiding. Like a being of light, that kind of. It could be a bean of light. It could be an angel being that, just, love, that right. just looks. It can be an, a family member that they even recognize. We have a few cases okay. of like senior family members that have predeceased, but they are managing the transition of the dying. They mm -hmm. are seemingly greeting the loved one and facilitating the transition. And we know that because um, the dying is communicating with the conductor. And it's the most common communication is, can I bring my deceased relative, which will be, which is the experiencer into the afterlife? Mm -hmm. Can I show them where I am? And the conductor uh, tends to say in the cases that we get, yes, you can bring him or her. To a certain point. To a certain yeah, yeah. point. To a certain point. And that brings up the other feature of boundary. And and yeah. almost in every case, the conductor will say, it's time to go now. We must go to the light. And, and obviously, the experiencer must return to their life, uh, human life. And we see the conduct. You know, we haven't done a deep dig on how many conductor cases we have. Part of the problem is we, you know, I discovered the conductor um during the research, I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd had illusions of it. I mean, I'd had like experiences of these elevated beings, but I didn't really get their sense of their purpose for a while. Like I didn't really get their job description. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then yeah. once I started uh, seeing more and more of it and I clarified it, I went back to some old cases and looked over it. I realized, oh, wow, this conductor has a particular presentation where they're 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 either seen or unseen and if they're unseen they're felt there was this force that was seemingly in charge and the dying was somehow waiting for this this force which we call the conductor to to begin this process of transition or to do another step in the transition um mm -hmm. and they tend to be very directive. When we see them, they're very directive. They'll look at the experiencer. We have a case where uh, the conductor, um, it, in fact, if your listeners are interested in this, they can go to our website, sharedcrossing.com, and go to a, a, a we call them a, a webinar that we gave with Gloria King, when I interview Gloria King, and uh, and it's in resources on our webpage. And Gloria yeah. talks about this tall light being, she calls him the tall one, appearing almost a week before her husband died. And this tall one um, is around, and she describes the light of the tall one coming from within. He, he had his own light from within. He had a, a type of human form, but not with distinguishable features. Like he couldn't, you know, eyes and ears and nose kind of silhouetted, but not, couldn't give color and things like that. So like kind of human shape, kind you know, but not definable features, so to speak. So, yeah. but this for a week, Gloria was in relationship with this tall one who would appear and then go away. And, and he was almost always around her dying husband who was dying of cancer. And then as the death approached the last 24 hours, she was right at the bedside and the tall one was right there with her. And she said the tall one even put her to sleep at times. She would feel just like we see this is also in our literature this caregiver loved one will just feel like they're getting knocked out, like almost under amnesia. And then she would wake up at a very important time um, to see some advancement in, yeah. in the dying's either progression towards death, but always waking up at the time where she could participate in the actual transition. So she saw him rise out of his body. Yeah. She, wow. she saw 
other beams of light come down as the greeting party, which is another feature in the SDE, the greeting party. And, yeah. um, and in a certain way, she felt like the tall one was both guiding her departing husband's transition, but also guiding her so mm. that she could be present. And she was getting the sleep she needed, the rest she needed so that she could be present at that time of transition. So that's wild. It's wild. And like I said, you yeah. can see that on our webpage. Um, Do you know what that makes me think of a little bit? It, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the in, in TVs and, you know, TV shows and films and everything and, and just in general pop culture, the personification of death, you know, when there's like that character who's, who's death and it's often like a tall person. We normally have the black cloak in, in our modern ways of doing it and a scythe or something, but if you take away the scythe and, and, you know, like maybe add a few more colors in there, it's like a tall being that kind of follows around the person for, for like whatever hours or days beforehand yeah. and, and is there at the transition and f kind of facilitates it in a way. Yeah. It's just made me, maybe think of that. Maybe that, 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 maybe that's kind of based on a historical, yeah. Cases like this. Um, anyway, Ben, I think it fits. I think it fits yeah. the one piece I would change is I think that that figure might be called the Grim Reaper. Um, mm, yeah. And, you know, sir, certainly That's Charles sad. Dickens <laughs> made reference to that, uh, that, that figure, um, the Grim Reaper. But I think the grimness of the conductor is in the directiveness of it. Sometimes we have cases where the conductor will say, stay away, mm. like back off from the body. So the conductor is protecting the yeah. energetic space of the dying. Uh, and so sometimes the conductor is much more gentle and compassionate. Um, yeah. And we see this in cases where, um, I don't have enough data to say this, but I certainly have two cases where a mother is holding a dying child and the conductor is there with no need to direct the mother in any way other than to let her. And in this case, the conductor, one case, the conductor was a beautiful woman. In fact, in both cases, beautiful woman, a beautiful angel. Uh, in fact, uh, this case, I think, is on our story library right now. Uh, you can go to, once again, sharegrossing.com if you want to see this case. I'll put that in the description, yeah. by the way, that link to share. It's Amelia. It's Amelia B. And she's actually from the UK. And she talks about this beautiful woman coming down. And, um, and she's sure that her dying son, she's sure that she came down to pick up her dying son because mm -hmm. she sees a tunnel in the light. Uh, although she wow. doesn't see her son going with the conductor but she does make the connection because when mm. she wakes up after, you know, wakes up coming into our shared conventional reality, after seeing the beautiful woman, she wakes up and Tom uh, is, is dying at that moment, transitioning right at that moment. Yeah. So wow. that's the conductor. That's amazing. Yeah, an amazing yeah. Feature. yeah, that's that, that's incredible. Yeah. Obviously, I've heard of, you know, like cases with the being of light and being of love and everything like that and family members. But yeah, to, to have it put like that is a bit different. You know, the idea of kind of pulling the strings or conducting yeah, the, the whole the whole situation. That's awesome. Um, I got a couple of kind of semi kind of quick questions and then maybe we can talk a little bit more about your your experiences or some experiences that people have shared with you in a little bit more detail. Um, so in terms of just a couple of quick ones, because you might even just answer no, I don't know if you've come across anything like this. Um, the first one would be popped into my head when you I can't remember exactly what you said. I've been kind of scribbling notes here as you go. Um, but I, w I was wondering whether you ever come across even one case of the so the person dying in in my question here would be an animal so say like the family dog is is on its last last legs its final days or hours or whatever um have you ever had a case where yeah somebody said i i kind of traveled with with my dog or the consciousness of my dog or, or what have you or something to that effect so shared crossings and pets it's something that we're and just at this time this very moment it's one of the two focal points of our research, the first being the conductor, mm -hmm. 
The second being um, the SDEs or shared crossings with pets. Mm. Uh, and the other area we're going into, I'll talk a little bit about later. We're still collecting SDEs, just so you know. But at this point in time, if anyone listening, you know, um, you'll get moved to the front of our interview line if you have a conductor or pet situation, um, because we're particularly interested in learning about this. Because it is one of the most common questions, um, particularly when I'm presenting someone will invariably open their, raise their hand or come up afterwards more commonly and say, you know, I think, is it possible to have an SDE with a pet? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, mm -hmm. And and there are people that have multiple SDEs. Now, so just so you know, 41% of our SDE experiencers will have more than one. So there seems to be a, there, so there seems to be an SDE, what I would call adept, what I do call adept, SDE adepts. So yes, people when their animals die, um, will have them. And we just, you know, one of the great cases we have is from uh, Suzanne Giesman, who's a wonderful medium. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just interviewed Suzanne a few months ago. And she had this with one of her dogs where she went in, you know, where she saw the spirit leave the body and then traveled with him a bit um, up into the afterlife. And, and we have this, you know, with cats, with dogs and with horses. We have a great case. I love this case where a woman was in the Caribbean and she wakes up in the middle of the night and her, uh, her horse, who she was very close to in Kentucky, I believe, or Tennessee, um, comes to her and says, I'm so sorry, but it was my time to go. And then she wakes up the next morning and the trainer for the horse calls her and says, I'm so sorry. But, and she stops her and she says, yes. She goes, I know, Chabot died last night. She goes, how did you know? Because Chabot came to me. Yeah. And so, so yes, with animals for sure. Um, and you know, once again, the relationship is very important. Remember in the beginning, I said yeah. one of the constituent aspects um, of the SDE is the strength of bond. And so you think we have strong bonds with our pets and, you know, and horses too. I mean, those of those of us who are familiar with the equestrian world or even just the working world, uh, those who work, you know, on, on in ranches and stuff with their horses and uh, are very close to the these animals these horses so yes yes ben for sure yeah that's that's very cool i'm glad to hear that and and i'm i'm glad that you are kind of yeah doing more research into it now because i think that's a really yeah fascinating area like you said and and i know that there are other you know scientists and researchers looking into these areas now in terms of like end of life experiences and animals and and various things like that so yeah that's awesome and i can't wait to see way more data on that over the coming months and and year or two um another kind of fairly probably a fairly quick question but uh, again i don't know how much you have to say on it if you've had any cases like this but in endies um there are very occasionally like dark NDEs, you know, like uh, somebody might feel they might have the same experience in some cases. It might be the same kind of tunnel experience, but for them it's negative and it feels scary. Or, you know, in very rare cases, I think some people do feel like they went to hell or to a place that was, yeah, like uh, dark and terrifying and, and what have you. Again, very rare, but have you come across these in SDEs? Are they as rare, rarer, less rare? Or Again, I, I know it's hard to say exactly, but yeah. Yeah. So um, the research you're referring to in the NDE literature is referred to as distressing NDEs. Oh, yeah. okay. and, and Nancy yeah. Bush is one of the leading researchers in there. Um, and I believe her research says between five and 10 percent of NDEs are distressing. Um, but I yeah, think I had six in my mind for some reason when I was asking the question. So that sounds yeah, about right. That sounds about right. And you know, and, and Nancy's research has been picked up and and carried forward by others. So there may be more um, up to date data on that. Mm -hmm. But for the SDE, the only distressing SDEs we have are what I have already referred to as the okay. sympathetic SDE, because if you have those strong physical sensations 
of vomiting, of nausea, of dizziness, of really acute body mm. pain uh, for the heart attack, cardiac situations, tight chestness, shortness of breath. That's scary. And that's distressing. Yeah. But yeah. when they realize that this happened at the time of death of a loved one and they were dying, uh, had a, you know, uh, symptoms that were similar to what they experienced, they re reorder or make new meaning of that experience, if that makes sense. And so mm -hmm. the distressing aspect of that SDE diminishes. And they yeah. see it as something, a type of connection or communication with the dying. So, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. But, but thankfully you haven't come across any cases where they're like traveling with the conductor and the person and they're like, oh, this is the gates of hell. Now you got to go back. And, and there's people shouting from inside, like, Can I leave them with us. We want to, yeah, there's nothing, nothing that dark no, and distressing. We don't That's have good. that. No. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, it's not necessarily that in in NDEs either, really, in in that sense. But but yeah, it's it's an interesting aspect of the phenomena. It might well come from, I guess, belief, you know, or expectation. But it's, it's obviously we'd just be speculating in in that in that sense for now. Um, so let me think before we get on to some of your experiences. I'm just looking at my awfully scribbled notes down here, thinking if there was anything else I really wanted to to mention to you. I mean, you said earlier about the the time, you know, like the gaps, and sometimes the the visitation or the the SD will happen before the person has passed away, or sometimes uh, a while after. And and I was thinking the one that's most interesting to me is maybe when it's like you know like hours before. And I, and do you? I, I know we probably don't have the the details to really go into those cases and say were, were those cases was the person physically in much worse condition because I'm I'm thinking like do you think it's possible or of course it's possible but what do you think about the idea that the consciousness of that person their soul or whatever it leaves the body before the body is officially shut down like it's kind of yeah it's shut down enough and and they're like right that's it i'm i'm done or you know i don't know how it works obviously but something something happens to allow them to leave early let's as it were yeah so you know i have a an interpretation of this mm -hmm. and and my interpretation is that based on my experience of working in hospice and being around people dying, you know, dying is defined medically as, you know, a certain time at yeah. 10 42 PM. So-and-so died time of death, yeah. time of death. I, I think that's not um, a particularly helpful way mm. to look at death. I think death for most of us, especially in the modern era where deaths tend to be more dragged out. Um, yeah. You know, there are the sudden deaths. That's about 10% of the cases where you die instantly of a heart attack or, or got, you know, this, the tragic deaths of a car accident or, you know, some sort of accident where you die suddenly, but most deaths are more gradual. And, and I think in those gradual deaths, and they tend to be from, you know, organ shutdown or, or gradual organ failure um that death happens over a longer period of time there's a titration mm -hmm. if you will of consciousness that individual consciousness in a human being call it the spirit soul what have you that's actually going back and forth that's mm -hmm. in the body leaving the body going into the next dimension back in the body I think that's a longer space than we give it credit for. And, and, you know, and I, and I will also um, kind of bow down and, and thank Dr. Peter Fennick um, because he, he too has asserted this view that if you listen to the experiences of those who work with the dying and even, even the dying themselves who will even say, gosh, I was in this other space, but then I came back, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, he says that dying is a process yeah. and it seems to be a process of the soul spirit gradually letting go of its home in the human, in the human body and, mm -hmm. and, and gradually titrating between these two realms. So 
you know, I joined Dr. Peter Fennick in that interpretation. And I think in those cases, it would be more likely that you would have what we call an early SDE. Yeah. Uh, and we do have cases like that, you know, where I'm thinking of a case um, where a woman um, was with her dying husband in a hospital and he was dying of cancer. And she reports just being around the clock with them. And at some point one evening, she just conked her head down, fell asleep momentarily. And in that moment, she immediately was in another space and she could see her husband out in front of her. And he and up in the distance, up in the distance, ascension here, once again, up in the distance, there were four beings of light and they were tall. And he was talking to them. And she, he recognized them, but she did not recognize them. But she knew from observing this that they were good. They were there mm -hmm. to greet him. They were, in my estimation, the conductors. That was a group of yeah. conductors. They were preparing him, guiding him, and it would eventually manage his death. And then she says, a few moments later, she woke up. And she looked down at her husband in the bed and she got, oh, my God, he must be dead. But he wasn't dead. And a few days later, he died. Yeah. But this would speak more to an SDE than it would be to a pre-death vision or visitation. Mm -hmm. um, just because there are a few other features there. Um, one yeah. is in a heavenly realm. There's ascension. She's seeing her deceased loved one, and he's moving towards these beings. These beings seem to be in charge of the journey. He recognizes them, um, and she sees in the distance a larger light that she says, oh, well, he must be heading towards that light. Yeah. So these suggest more, when you see the journey motif, when you see this is the outer edges, the beginning of an SDE. Mm. Yeah. Wow. During that, you just said something. You said, um, I think you mentioned 10% of your cases are sudden deaths. They, they die yeah. suddenly, about 10%. I, 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 I haven't got the statistics in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that there's not 10% of the population that dies suddenly, right? So would you agree no, no, that that's you're no, more uh, that, likely? That, that data is, I think, I'd have to check with our medical director, but I think sudden deaths happen, sudden deaths being like cardiac arrest, accidents of different types, yeah. Um, sudden organ shutdown. Um, I have a feeling it's, around eight to 10 percent but i, I oh, you, okay okay yeah okay i was just i was thinking it was like a bit lower than that and i was thinking that maybe having a sudden death made you more likely to have an nde in this in, in a similar way that the you know jim tucker's work on children with past life memories at dops like uh, you they have a higher proportion of of cases from people that died either suddenly or via unnatural causes. It seems like dying suddenly or unnaturally makes you more likely to, to reincarnate or for somebody to remember seemingly your life um, <laughs> in the future. So anyway, I was yeah. just wondering whether that was, yeah, potentially kind of another similar feature here, but. Yeah, I know, I know Jim's research on that. And one of the questions I would have for Jim and uh, Ian Stevenson, who his predecessor had a similar findings mm -hmm. as well. Oh, well, they, they use the same data set. Um, yeah. Jim's built on it. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I would throw into that um, inquiry is that sudden deaths, almost by definition, are premature deaths. Mm, yeah, well, there, there's that. There's that there's, as well. So actually. it's the younger population. Yeah, um, yeah. It doesn't They've got like a graph as well. What's that? In his book. He, I, have you, have you, you've probably read Jim's book. He's got like a, a graph in yeah. one of the pages, like a kind of bar chart. And it shows that very clean, like um, they have this number of cases with, with, you know, people that died when they were under 10 or whatever. Yeah. And, and this number when they were in their teens and this number. And, and it kind of, yeah, gradually goes down. And so the, the least amount is when you die old and via, you know, natural causes, seems like there's the least amount of cases of that. Whereas, yeah, a child, 
yeah much more likely yeah yeah, yeah. the premature death so it's fascinating isn't it it is fascinating but yeah i yeah i have to be very cautious about my assertion that um you know eight to ten percent die suddenly i i can't i i haven't i haven't reviewed that no, it's literature. fine yeah I won't quote you on it. We'll uh, we'll we'll come we'll come back to that one next time yeah. we talk, and we'll, we'll, yeah, one I'll of us will make it. sure we have the stat. Yeah, um, and we'll see. Yeah, because I I mean, obviously with gym stuff as well, they've had people working on it longer than you have, so they have more cases, and so they can kind of draw, even if not definitive conclusions, they can kind of maybe you know draw a few more conclusions, and we can maybe say that yes, yeah, so we can see more patterns and things like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, really interesting. I look forward to, to circling back to it. I guess let's maybe jump into hearing about some experiences. Um, I obviously want to hear about your own experiences. Maybe before, I'm just trying to weigh up how we're going to handle our last like half an hour. Um, but maybe first, if you want to share, maybe if I could say like the most profound or one of the most profound stories that you've been told by somebody that had a, a shared death experience and then maybe we can kind of finish off with with some of your experiences um and then everything else can can wait for next time yeah you know um the for me the cases that are most compelling um are usually the more recent cases because i'm mm. i i I just those are the ones I'm studying and, and working with. I you know I I we do long interviews, uh, two hour plus interviews typically, and I have one case that came through, um, and her name is Ari Ariana, and she's now 18 years old. She may be 19, but 18, 19 years old. And she tells an SDE that when she was six years old, she was in a, a tornado with her family. And she describes being in her father's arms next to her mother and then her two grandparents and then her niece. And there, this is in Northern Alabama. And at all of a sudden she hears a screeching and a crushing of, you know, of metal and glass and wood and a horrific sound. And then she goes blank. Mm -hmm. And the next thing she remembers is she's traveling up uh, a stairway of sorts, a light in the distance. And she has two angels around her. And what she sees in front of her is her mother and her father, her two grandparents, and her niece. And they all have angels around them. Wow. And, and by the way, Jesus is there as well. And Jesus is affirming her that everything is okay. And she says, Jesus is absolutely gorgeous. The most beautiful yeah. being she's ever seen. She knows it's Jesus, but it's not the Jesus that she's could describe or yeah. draw. It's a different, you know, similar but far more beautiful and so loving and so comforting. And he's saying to her, everything's going to be okay. Um, and then they approach this light, this ring of light, and everybody goes through that light except for her. Mm. Wow. and then she remembers waking up in the hospital and her grandmother her only surviving grandmother uh you know family That's member cool. direct family member is right there and wow. she asks where my where's my mom and her mother has to give her the information. And she says, uh, I know. And then she says, you know, later, they're okay. And then Ari, very smartly, asked for crayons and paper. And she draws out what she saw. Mm. And she's got beautiful drawings of this time. So, um, 
That SDE is what we call a juvenile SDV, S -S um, SDE. We don't have a lot of juvenile SDEs. Mm. I was going to ask you that earlier, like how common is it in no, children? Not at all. Mm. Um, we maybe have a handful, you know, well, maybe a couple dozen. People remember these experiences. So we have people that will come to us in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s and report things in in adolescence, um, young 20s sometimes, horrific deaths, you know. We, have a, we do have a fair amount of those teenagers, you know, but but not six years old no. and certainly not in no case in no time have we, have I ever worked with a case where so many people died and she saw five of her direct relatives dying. So she wrote a book, uh, a, uh, not her, but a, a close friend of hers. So the person who actually came into her life to really comfort her during this time, um, mm -hmm. And um, the book is is called The Girl Who Saw Heaven. The Girl Who Saw Heaven. It's a spectacular book. It's written by uh, Lisa Reborn, Reburn, Reburn. And um, it actually happens to have the same publisher uh, of my book. Um, my book is At Heaven's Door. And uh, but this we have the same publisher, actually the same publisher, Simon and Schuster, the same agent and the same uh, editor. We both use oh, really? same same editor, Priscilla Payton, editor in chief of uh, Simon and Schuster. So and she actually happened to do Evan Alexander's book. Uh, yeah, same same heaven. team, Proof of Heaven. So you know, Gail Ross is our agent and. Uh, Priscilla Payne. Any book with heaven in the title, they just say, well, Priscilla, come on. <laughs> as we all know, the editor in chief there, Priscilla, yeah. Priscilla loves heaven in the title. Um, yeah. Anyway, and she's she's lovely because she really wants to validate these experiences for the right reasons because it brings a lot of healing to people. And, yeah. um, and she considers these books to be canon books, like books that will be read forever like these are seminal mm. books on the sde and in Eben's case the nde um but will be resources for people forever you know yeah. uh, and uh i hope that's the case um yeah so yeah so that's a case that i just um came you know i've known about the case for now a little over a year and a half um but now that the book was published recently, um, it's a fast, it's a wonderful book. And, and it's not just about an SDE. It's about how, she, about Ari's life after the SDE, how she made yeah. sense of it in her particular culture in the Southern United States. Um, wow. It's a beautiful book and it's very well yeah. written. Um, anyway, yeah. so uh, for those who want to hear more about it, so that's one. I'll put the link to that as along with your That'd book be great. In the description yeah. and, and some other books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisa Reborn. Um, and then, you know, I just heard another case um, in the last couple months, and this is by uh, Sarah, and Sarah's Swiss, and she has this um, tragic but just profound story where she reports living in La Paz, Bolivia, with her fiance. And she starts having dreams. And in these dreams, this spirit being, this light being, she calls a light being, shows up to her and tells her, essentially, your life is going to change a lot. And lets her know that it's going to be painful. And then this light being gives her this ball of light and inserts it into her heart and says, you will have this to support you. And she has this dream recurrent. And then on her honeymoon, some months later, um, in Colombia, her husband drowns. And she's right next to him as he's drowning and wow. she, oh i should say that 
in that vision, in that vision or visitation by this light being, the light being says, trust and surrender, surrender and trust. And so in that moment, when she's on the verge of drowning, she remembers this light being, trust and surrender. And she says, oh, I won't fight the waves. She survives, but she looks over and she sees her husband and he's struggling and he's fighting and he goes down. And then sometime, a few moments later, He's rescued. She's on the shore. He's rescued. And they bring him on shore and they start, you know, doing CPR and all the rest of it. And she goes out of her body. And she immediately sees a review of his life and then her life. So life review. Mm. And then she sees him and he's okay. And then she sees the light beam and she says to the light beam, save him, bring him back. And the light beam says, I cannot intervene. And then she has this higher consciousness of knowing. Mm. And in this knowing, she says, she realizes it's his time. And it's all okay. And remember what I said in the definition of the SDE in the very beginning, because this is one of the hallmarks, this higher consciousness in this space, the SDE experiencer knows everything is how it should be. This is the end of a human life, but life continues. Her husband is alive and well. And he asked her to do a few things, care for his mother. Mm. Um, and she assures him that I will survive and I will find a way to live a meaningful life. And that, in a certain sense, gives him permission to go. So there's a deep, deep, meaningful, otherworldly conversation between Sarah and her husband. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that's this. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And so, you know, those are just two of the more recent experiences. But when we have, you know, I mean, I would encourage your readers if they really want to learn more about the SDE, um, out of the you know 200 plus cases we had at the time of when i wrote my book um we took you know 28 of some of the best ones and i just think we i i tried to really um give the full continuum of experiences and i also tried to do it in a way that was evidential um, mm -hmm. and you know and i think when you listen to sarah's case um, there's evidence in that. She says that she knew months in advance that something awful was going to happen. She even shares as they're walking to the beach, her husband shares that he's always been afraid of drowning. Oh, really? As a child, he was always scared of drowning. Yeah. So, I mean... You know, we 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 do as much as we can, you know, with our limited understanding of what a human life is and and who we are beyond this human life. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I always, you know, say, you know, we we must bow down to the grandeur, to the mystery, to the unknowing of these yeah. experience that these experiences delivered to us. I mean, they're just awe inspiring. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I had my, yeah. some of my interview team on for Sarah recently, and we did two interviews, two hours each. We kept going through all the features and, 
asking these questions and Sarah's lovely. And, and at the end of it, you just like, you know, you just say, wow, mm. wow. This human life has such meaning in it. And, and, and yet it is part of a larger um, trajectory of our soul, spirit, body. And, you know, like I said earlier, no SDE experiencer that I have interviewed suggests that human life stops at human death. It goes on in some yeah. form, whether it expires somewhere else. That's yeah. not what the SDE looks at or or reveals, but yeah. it certainly yeah. survives human death. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of how I, when I ask that question now, I mean, I, I don't feel like we're going to, I'm probably not going to ask you any more questions today, but when I ask that question to my guests these days, I typically, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure we're on the same page or from what you've said already, we're on the same page and that we think we survive this. The evidence suggests that yeah. something survives death. It's just what happens and, and how, you know, it's so intricate and nuanced. Like you said earlier, there's so many and, and conflicting as well. Sometimes there's like bits that, that make other, you know, it kind of that goes against it. And it's like, Oh, not that goes against survival, but just that make it all harder to, to, un, to, to grasp, you know, to, to really make sense of it. Um, like, the hows and whys if I, if you know what i mean yeah um the great reality did you want to say anything else you just kind of mentioned your book and that you have 28 cases in there did you want to say anything else about your book so people kind of get an idea um again what what's obviously it's going to be all about sdes there's going to be 28 cases of of sdes is there is there anything else you wanted to mention briefly i mean i mean it's just you know we wrote that um and i say we because i had a you know a a good deal of help um, from Simon Schuster and we, you know, and just to really shape what we were trying to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. my researcher, Dr. Michael Kinsella uh, has been involved with the research. And, um, and so, you know, all of us kind of looked at this thing and um, we were trying to provide the most, um, the most cases are the most normal people. Like mm. what's so important for people to recognize is shared death experiences happen to everyday people. Yeah. And when you read the stories, you cannot deny that, that these experiences happen. They're profound and they're healing. They offer the seeds of healing. So if you, when you lose a loved one, it's tragic. And many of the cases we present are with premature deaths, if you will. We have we start the book with, you know, the second and third cases are two women, mothers on two different continents, Australia and North America, and they lose infants. Their infants die and they have very similar experiences and they had no idea that this experience was possible yeah so when you hear that you're like oh you know you can't make this stuff up and um so so yeah i would just say that you know there's no doubt that that the that my book at heaven's door is the first research-based book it's written for the general public but it's it's socked it's packed with 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 data in a good way very readable yeah um you can really get a sense for the totality of the experience um so yeah i mean if people are interested and of course you know our webpage sharecrossing.com there's videos you can see there um about and some of the people in those videos are in the book not very many i think maybe one or two um mm -hmm. so so yeah, and you know, and we have good resources on the web page as well. If you just want to go there first, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I just one thing I would say is, you know, some people you haven't asked me this, but you know, how did I get into this? I'll say just briefly about this. Yeah, I, I, I honestly, that was one of my first questions I meant to. We just got so into yeah. it straight away that I was like, ah, maybe later yeah. or maybe next time. Well, but yeah, please, sure. please. But just briefly, you know, 
Um, and and also just in like 30 seconds you were you were kind of working in hospice and you were a psychotherapist do you want to just give kind of a 30 second like what you were doing and then like how you got into it if you can kind of package that together yeah no i can just say you know it's really important to know that i was living a normal life in a suburb in, mm. in silicon valley just south of san francisco in california and i had a near-death experience skiing i crushed my spine in a high-speed skiing accident and catapulted out of my body, sailed to the light, talked to God, um, which I call God, source, however you want to call it, and pled to come back. And I I came back, but that experience changed me radically in ways that as a 17-year-old boy, you know, I didn't speak of the SDE for like nine or 10 years, but then I had a second SDE with a blood imbalance in an ICU. And then I had an OBE for, I want to say between two and four hours hovering over my bed. Wow. So I was very comfortable with this reality that I survived human death, but then a series of health problems. And, um, you know, I, I ended up working in hospice. In, in Zen Hospice in San Francisco, because I was drawn to death. By this time, I had a Buddhist practice because I was trying to make sense of all my pain from my injuries and blood imbalance and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. And, and I had trouble walking and, and I did Zen Hospice. And it was there that I had my first SDEs, um, just working with patients at their bedside, 24 bed hospice, people dying often. And and I just found myself hovering above a, a patient's body one day. I was reading to him a story and popped out of his body. His name was Ron. And there I was looking at him above his body and me there along with him, looking down at his body and my body and him basically telling me, check this out. This is where I am right now. This is where I go every now and then. So that idea that I came up with earlier that I share with Peter Fennec, this titration mm-hmm. of, of soul spirits going in and out of their body as they're transitioning. Um, that's where I really landed on me that this is what it's about. Now I had many other SDEs there and would subsequently have SDEs with other friends and family. And, um, I that's where I also ha- have a strong notion or now it's based on research. There are adepts. There are people like me, mm. um, psychopomps, if you will. Those of us who can travel across the boundary, the, the veil, if you will, cross the veil when that veil opens. Um, do you find you have, sorry to interrupt, do you find you have more like psychic experiences as well? Or is it just the 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 kind of shared death experiences? Oh, I think I have more intuitive psychic experiences. I, I can know when my loved ones are having problems or challenges or stress. Um, yeah. I send a sense into that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do you meditate a lot? You know, I do episodically. It's funny. I haven't, I was just telling uh, a good friend, God, I'm not meditating as much as I used to in large part yeah. because of the, the workload um, that we have. But no, I, I try to meditate, um, you know, a lot. Um, yeah. And when I do, I'm much more grounded, much more content. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I was I made a, uh, a comment about this earlier. We do find about 60 some odd percent of our experiencers have some sort of mindfulness practice. And I'm in that yeah. category as well. Um, yeah. So... So yeah. Well, look, we got a lot left to discuss next time. Okay. I, uh, I, I I can't wait to like hear in detail about more of your you know experiences, your SDEs and 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 your NDE in in a bit more detail. Um, that'd be brilliant, and and we'll discuss end of life experiences and everything like that. I think we gave a good go on shared death experiences today. Um, next time, some more shared death experiences experiences. And um, and yeah, we'll talk some some end of life experiences. But this this was brilliant. This has been fascinating. I've I've, I've loved this conversation. Um, I really appreciate you giving me your time and everything. And and I look forward to doing it again. So it, before I let you go, have you got any kind of last words or message you want to send to anybody that's watched or listened? It can be anything at all. 
I mean, just to trust yourself and to, you know, when you have these experiences, and I say when you have them, because I think a big part of having these experiences is knowing that they exist and that you can have them. Mm. And if you do have any of these end of life experiences, and I mentioned them earlier, the spectrum of end of life experiences, get familiar with that. That's a way of being a wise human being, getting familiar mm. with the terrain at end of life and after death uh, experiences as well. And when you have them, because I think a lot of your listeners will, um, trust them, honor them, explore them. Yeah. And and then if you if you have any of these experiences, let us know. We'd love to share Crossing Project. We would yeah, love yeah. to hear your cases. Uh, because we- So where can people reach out to you? And also tell your friends about them yeah. because the more we just talk about it in general, the better. But where can people reach uh, like out to the Shared Crossing? Shared you Crossing, and, and to- excuse me. Yeah, sharedcrossing.com. And you can just go to our contact page. Uh, you can email okay. us. You can also email us at info at sharedcrossing.com. Yeah. And one of our team members will will get back to you. Uh, sometimes it takes a while. Awesome. Um, but we we do we do. Uh, but if if they have a conductor or an animal involved in your shared death experience, put that in the subject line. And yeah, that helps. They'll get back to you sooner this time. That helps. That helps get you to the front. Um, yeah. But we'll get to you. You know, like we do. We have. You know, like I said, we have ten researchers now, uh, interns from around the world. If you want to study these experiences as well, you want to join our volunteer research team. We have a lovely committed, wise, exceptionally skilled uh, research team, which we train, which, uh, you know, Dr. Michael Kinsella, uh, one of our researchers, he was chief of researcher research. He's, he's still uh, leading our research in that way, training our interns. You get to work with him and then eventually with me um, as we go through these cases, sit in on interviews, uh, do the coding, write them up. And uh, yeah, so if you're interested, reach out to us in that way too. Awesome. Well, look, thank you again so much for this, William. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to doing it again. Thank you, Ben. Pleasure to be here with you and your viewers. Thank you to William Peters for talking with me. Thank you for listening to us. And a massive thank you to our patrons for helping us to stay afloat. I hope you enjoyed the interview and are a little less afraid of dying than you were before listening. Please subscribe if you'd like to unravel the mysteries of the universe with us. And if you'd like to help us keep making content, please consider a small monthly donation via Patreon. Thank you.